This Three Beards Media podcast may contain mature themes. And if you're not down with that, we got three words for you. Like the podcast. Nailed it. Would you like to sample some of my nuts? Hello and welcome to another epi- episode of Old Man Strength. I am your host, Chris Shipley. My normal host, Aaron Wall, is out. So in the Theme of Tights uh, podcast, uh, we brought somebody in from the uh, bullpen. You missed a hell of a game, man. Take a seat. We'll see if we can get this guy out for you. Right. Good game, Eddie. Give me Vaughn. You want Vaughn? I know he hadn't done very well against this guy, but I got a hunch he's due. So, you know... <laughs> It was 50-50 on who I was going to bring in here, but uh, I brought my uh, my pal, my buddy, Drew Shipley, not related. Drew, how are you from Maryland tonight? I'm great, Chris. Hey, it's uh, old man's strength after dark, old man's strength after dark, right? So Yeah, that's right. There's no rules. I, I kind of feel like you gave me this invite because you you somehow knew I'm, I'm starting to receive AARP mailers <laughs> into my mailbox, so... Like now, now, now I get to play. Now I get to play with the old men. Listen, so. I, you, you, you sign up the right time. You get a free little travel kit. That's what I got when I signed up. I'll be damned. I'll be <laughs> so, damned. It's a, and it's worth it's worth absolutely nothing because the ten percent AARP discount when you do all all said and done, it doesn't really matter. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> so I got a free travel kit and an, and an, and an, and a magazine every week. So hey, you never know when it's going to come in handy, Chris. You know that's right. You never know. <laughs> So uh, Aaron is uh, working. He was on a flight. He wasn't going to make it in time. Then he thought he was going to, and then his boss pulled him in. So, so uh, Drew, thank you so much for coming on. How you been? Absolutely, man. Been great. Uh, d- did a little traveling into in, into the the great South uh, the last couple of weeks for work myself down in Mississippi, doing some uh, military training down there. So it's it had been a long two weeks. So this has been my first full week back. In, into the homestead, so it's been nice to to get back home and into the swing of of normal life, I guess. I'll bet. I just booked a trip to Phoenix in the middle of July. I'm not sure what that says about me. It's going to be 180 degrees down there, but it's for the boys' Williams Syndrome trip, so that should be fun. Uh, we we got free tickets to the Diamondbacks game, and I almost passed on them until somebody told me that they covered the roof, and I was like, oh, okay, well then I'll go because I don't really want to melt in the middle of that. So, oh, you you absolutely have to go to Chase Field, Chris. Actually, oh, we're going. Probably- it, it was probably the second ballpark I've been to uh, after Wrigley Field and, until I moved out here to the east and, and checking out all the ballparks on the eastern seaboard. But uh, yeah, Chase Field's pretty beautiful, and yeah, it's it, it's close, Chris. It's it's yeah, a nice to be in there. You we're should going. get the pool. You, you should get the pool tickets though. No, we, we're getting free tickets, so I'm pretty sure they're not pool tickets. <laughs> we're getting tickets provided for us, but we'll take what we can get. But that Fair fits enough. into the theme of tonight's uh, episode because baseball. Uh, is in full swing, and uh, we are super excited to bring on uh, a, an author, uh, a, a local sports uh, director here. Uh, he's uh, prominent on Twitter. Uh, author, what else have I missed, Scott Reister? Uh, father of three, one uh, cheerleading practice going on upstairs in the ceiling above me, so it's <laughs> rattling. Um, Nine year old just said goodnight over there. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all the above. No, it's great to be great to be here with you guys. Thank you for having me, Chris. You buried the lead. His his name literally says on the screen, "Agent." I know, Scott. I know. <laughs> yeah, I threw that in there. Eight, yes, um, I, I had a, a book signing yesterday, at Barnes and Noble. I'll show you guys the pictures. Uh, yeah, I dressed up as a like character from the book, and uh, one of my good friends who helped me write the book. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Or, or she helped me edit it, I should say. Uh, she dressed up like in full agent clothes. We had we had some great pictures, a lot of great <laughs> fun over at Barnes and Noble. So it's it's been a blast. That sounds that sounds like a lot of fun. Let's let's. Uh, I, I want to get to your book, but part of what we do here in Old Man Strength is. Originally, the first host and I, when we did this, we started talking about our dads and our growing up and how we raise our kids and stuff like that. And that's just kind of delved into what we do here and that we learn a little bit. I mean, everybody sees you on TV. Everybody sees you on Twitter and your professional role. 
tell us a little bit about Scott Reiser, where he grew up and, and, and some of the values that he got there. Sure. So I'm from Dallas, Texas. Uh, I went to University of Texas in Austin. So oh, okay, I got to let you go, Scott. I guess I got to. <laughs> well, it's it's sad, you know, all the hate, all the fun, and they're leaving for the SEC. It's like I'm so mad at them. It's like uh, it's such a money grab, and like I hate it personal, selfishly. I love having the like I had buddies come to the Texas Iowa State game uh, two, the last two times they came, and I go and watch it with my friends from school, and I'm so divided. And it's like they're like what do you mean you're not cheering for Texas? And I'm like, well, I am, but like I've lived in Iowa. But I'm going to live here. <laughs> I know I've been here 15 years. It's like, I know Matt Campbell, like personally. And it's like, I don't know uh, uh, the Texas players. And uh, you know, I don't, I don't know Sark. So whatever it's been. Yeah. I'm definitely conflicted, but yeah, from a, uh, from Texas, my wife and I both went, went there. Um, I, 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 from there, I got a TV job for a year in college station, Texas. So I went from being a longhorn and covering the Aggies and I was in Waco and I had this whole plan mapped out and you guys can probably relate in your own careers. Like in my mind, I was like, I'm going to work in Waco for a couple of years and I'm going to get a job in um, Austin and then San Antonio. And then in Dallas, I'll be a sports anchor in Dallas for the eight years. And then I'll just stay in Dallas forever. So um, the I-35 plan sort of came into fruition. <laughs> so I'm in Des Moines and I've been here for 15 years. Um, just, and, uh, I will, I do travel back down to Dallas quite a bit, a couple times a year, um, going there actually next weekend, to see the family. So, um, yeah, we're very, we're thrilled to be out here. We love it here. Um, and, uh, yeah, moved here in 2009 with my daughter and my wife. And now she is uh, just about to turn 16 and I have sons 13 and nine. Um, people of Iowa are fantastic. Uh, it's a great place to live and raise a family. And, um, it's a great, great sports town. So professionally, it's been a really great fit. And personally, we've really liked it a lot. I didn't really talk about values, but maybe, maybe I touched on. We'll get there. We'll get there. I was waiting for Drew <laughs> yeah. to jump in. Drew looked like no, you no, my fault. No, we're good. Um, so what brought you? Was it the job here that that brought you here, or was there another job first, or what? How did that work? Yeah. So uh, from uh, the college station, then Waco, and then I actually was a sports director in the state of Washington. Um, I, I got an offer to go out there to a place called the Tri Cities. I would never heard of any of the cities, let alone all three of the Tri Cities. Um, you guys ever hear of this place in Washington? Out of curious, just curious. I've never heard of no. Tri Cities. Right. So, yeah, Tri Cities. No way. So, it's uh, Richland, Kennewick, and Pasco. It's yeah, I uh, can't imagine why I wouldn't know what those are. Right, exactly. <laughs> so you may have heard of Yakima. That was in the yeah. market also. And so we covered all of them. We were just uh, southwest of Spokane by a little bit. So got to do some awesome stuff out there. We did like hydroplane race, racing, live coverage of that. And uh, we did a, the Arena Football League Championships with the Spokane Shock and Tri-Cities Fever. So it was a really great place to live, just really, really far away. And then, uh, you know, he signed contracts in this business for two, three years at a time. Um, and my contract was coming up and I was trying to get uh, a little high profile, more high profile job. And um, yeah, I got got the job offer from the station in Des Moines, moved down here. And um, I thought I'd be here a couple of years and then move on. And I uh, never had an offer that was better, uh, you know, from a personal or professional standpoint. Um, had some opportunities, always decided this was the place we wanted to be. So, um, yeah, it was the job that brought us here. And uh, it's the people that kept us here. And um, I love the snow. Some people say like, oh, what about the snow? I personally love it. I grew up in Texas, never got to play with it. So I'm making up for lost time. I go sledding. I build snowmen. I'm a giant kid. My kids love it. I'm always playing with them. So um, it's been a good time. Is is there an end goal for you, Scott? Is there is there a dream place that you would like and a dream job you'd like to end up when it's all said and done? Or is Des Moines kind of – is Des Moines home? Or I mean, is, yeah. is it up to – you know, whatever. Yeah, happens, that's a happens. great question. Um, like, if I had a opportunity to be like a main sports guy in Dallas, that'd be hard to turn down. Um, uh, but outside of that, um, you know, I used to think like I want to go like move to you know Connecticut and be on ESPN. But now I'm thinking, oh, that's so far away. It's like I would have to drive. And for me, at this point in my life, <laughs> three kids, like as you get older, um, it's not necessarily how much money you make or even like the higher status. It's more about your ability to maintain the the flexibility you have in your schedule um because you know juggling a job where i work nights like the ability to be in charge of the department kind of manage the schedule how i need it uh, not to take away anything from our coverage but just to to be able to make sure that I, i'm not missing the big stuff my kids have and you know i'm able to take the a lot of vacation days and um so I'm, I'm very like afraid to give all that kind of thing up um so my my goals have definitely changed um this this kind of like i, I i'm living my dream i do really do have my dream job 
Um, and then this has been kind of like the next dream I've attacked. Hey, look at that. It's like, <laughs> yeah, this has been like my next, my next dream. So it's like uh, another dream I'm living right now. And I, I definitely have goals for that as well. Well, let, let's kind of dive into that. So you obviously have written a book, Baseball Spy. First impressions, it's you sit down, you think you're going to write a book. What motivates that? And, and how did you begin to form the plot or even the idea of what you wanted to write about? Right. So um, for me, like I always thought it'd be cool to write a book. But the bigger thing was I always had this idea in my head of like if Little League was life or death. And that was like, I always thought like it was. Have you been to a little league game before? Some of those parents think that, Scott. I know, I know. (laughs) I I remember thinking that as a kid and feeling that kind of pressure and that kind of heat. And then also I was always really infatuated with any sports movie that also kind of combined action or spies. And there's not that many, you know, you can think of like, there was like that Steven Seagal movie where he's like, uh, like in the hockey game. I don't know if you guys remember that, like sudden death. Yeah. Yeah, like there's just some random movie. okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and I always thought it was the coolest thing. That was Jean Claude Van Damme. That's where it got me messed up. I was like, right. I'm pretty sure Seagal's never been in a hockey. I'm sorry. Movie. I'm sorry. Yeah, I got Scott, my '90s I, action here. I, I didn't up. have it. I didn't have much of a life. So movies, I know a lot about. So that's the only reason why I do that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. But no. No offense or no, uh, no disrespect to Jean Claude. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I always like was in fa- like fascinated, like, well, like if there was somehow a way to like combine the, the results of the game in with like some sort of high stakes life or death situation. And there really was no like book about that. Like you can read all the books in the world about like sports, but like combining like li- literally life or death. So that always, the idea always stuck with me. Um, <clears throat> I always felt like I sort of dabbled in writing here and there, but never took it seriously. And then around 2018, I was like really gradually became obsessed with the idea of how to write a book. And um, so I podcasted nonstop. That's like mowing the yard, working out, cleaning my house, whatever it was. I was always podcasting. I did listen to podcasts called like uh, middle grade ninja was one um, story, uh, story grid, like all these different things. It was all about, for me, it was all about story structure. I was really fascinated with uh, how stories were formulated in a way that were like really exciting and like sort of the science behind it. And so I did that for like two years, all while I had this idea that I would just sit there and think about. And it was like growing and growing in my head. And um, then uh, I, I don't know how long you want me to keep going, but I'll just, I'll no, just you, story. Okay. Scott, it's your show. You, you <laughs> talk all you want. The best right. guests are the ones that keep talking. So, all right, there you go. I'll make it Nobody easy. Nobody wants okay. to listen to me and Drew. That's for God's sake. Right. That's all right. right. So um, basically it was twofold. It was like, all I was, I was, really obsessed with the process of how to write the, how to write this great book and, and basically take the idea I had and apply it with what I knew. But then also I was really obsessed with learning how to um, get a book deal and how that whole worked. And, and I really, it was really like important for me to take that part of the equation and set it to the side and put all my mental energy that I had, which wasn't that much space in each day because of how busy everybody is. Like I might have 20 minutes a day at the end of the night or maybe a few minutes in the morning, or I could steal a minute here and there. So that mental energy, I really focused on the science behind the book. And I came up with this idea of um, if uh, somebody on his team is like a deadly spy, he doesn't know who. And because people love books where you don't know someone's bad. And so you learn all the characters and someone's got a secret. And then um, from that, um, how do you make the twists and turns? Who's in the book? What it's, what's it about? And I kind of settled on the fact, uh, to what, the way to make the story work um as this idea grew and grew it became more and more exciting um so the idea i came up with was this kid is new on his team his name's zane mitchell this takes place in washington dc and um he goes to his he had a fight he has a fight with his mom he just lives with his mom his dad died a few years ago in a car accident and uh, he's adjusting his mom's always moving around and she works for this government agency called the Cybersecurity reinforcement unit totally made up but it sounds realistic <laughs> it sounds uh, real the cru so his mom is an analyst at this big government agency he's having a fight with her he goes to his game she says she'll meet him there uh the very first line of the book is where was she and so he uh he gets to the game and his mom doesn't show up he's all mad you know he's, he's having a crappy game things aren't going his way he gets home and he's all mad because his mom just totally stiffed him, you know, didn't come up, didn't get him a ride. He walks home and there's this agent waiting at his house. And he's like, uh, and his mom's missing. And his mom, this agent's like, hey, there's somebody that uh, we need your help because we just found out that there's been a cyber attack on your field. 
uh, somebody on your team is actually this deadly spy, a cyber spy. And uh, it just so happens that there's this like physical location where you can set up a computer and hack into this nearby government building. And that physical location is like this weak spot in the government defense systems. And it's like, and just by happenstance, it's on this field. And then somebody has figured this out, sent in a kid uh, to do this dirty work and download the secret. And uh, if this, if this unknown baseball player is successful, they're going to expose the identities of all these spies across the world and everyone's going to die. And so Zane Mitchell has this mission. He's got to figure out who on his team is a spy. He's got to locate this hidden device buried on the field. And he also can't tip off this unknown person that he's on to him because otherwise this person will like, uh, you know, pick up their stuff and scram and they want to catch this person in the act. So he's got to go undercover himself and he's got like the secrets. He's got like the secret agent earpiece. He's got something. <laughs> like well, so he really is like a baseball spy. He's like James Bond in little league. And, um, and so then the stakes, and this is where like the story structure stuff that I learned all came in like it's progressive complication. Like you think, you know, what's happening. And then I, I, I give a big twist that raises the stakes and then all this. And then every time you think what's going to happen, it goes wrong. The stakes get raised more and more and more. And then finally there's like a big mind blowing twist at the end of act one. And then another big mind blowing twist at the end of act two, where you find out who the spy is and you're like, ah, no way. And then it leads into the epic showdown scene and the, and all the greatness of act three. Um, so yeah, it, like it's been really exciting um, I, uh, I was really happy with the manuscript and, um, you know, I ended up getting an agent and then a, a, a book deal. And now it's the number one new release on Amazon. Um, and it's congratulations kind of baseball. So it's really cool. And I can tell you more details about that process of getting an agent, but that's, that's the, the sort of like the gist of how I figured out how to write this book. Um, also got a lot of help. So. Yeah, it's it's given me a very uh, Carmen San Diego vibe a little bit. I like hopefully I like a that. little cooler and edgier than Carmen San Diego. <laughs> hey I, I man, think... every, Carmen San Diego was sweet for me. Right, again, uh, Scott, I mean, it's old yeah. man strength. We you got to remember we're that that was that was the legit when we were kids. When I love it. No, I love Carmen <laughs> San Diego. So. Yeah, yeah. I was definitely trying to uh, go for like the edgier, cool vibe. You know, kids as young as eight or nine read this book, love it. But yeah, I want it. I want adults to love it and want it, and teenagers think it's cool too. So, so let me ask you this: How, how obviously the baseball part is probably easy, right? You're a baseball mm -hmm. fan. You're a sports fan. But when you're talking about cybersecurity and you're talking about maybe Washington D.C., how much research are you doing to make sure that what you're putting in the book is halfway accurate? Right. So honestly, like at first I got hung up on that and I was like researching how to hack into stuff. And then I'm thinking, what am I doing? Like, I don't, there's no way I'm going to ever even like come close to getting this right. I'm not trying to write like, you know, it is like Robert Ludlum describing how things go in. So honestly, for me, it all had to fit the story. So like whatever science existed, existed in the only, the only reason it existed was to fit the story I needed to create for okay. Little League being life or death. So I really didn't care too much, to be honest with you. Um, I did look up the location, uh, and this is cool. I'm going to actually be contacting Washington, D.C. Spy Museum. I'm going to be trying to get some media, uh, some press coverage in D.C. Um, there is the actual building, and Drew, I'm sure you could tell us all about it. Like in Langley is one government building, George uh, Washington Center for – or George Bush Center for Intelligence. Um, and then there's uh, up in Fort Meade is the NSA. And then the, the, the book takes place in Hillendale which is absolutely actually a place on the map, which is just between those two. And so the idea that I had in my head was there's a, a secret information link that goes between the NSA and the George Bush Center for Intelligence. And somebody figured out you could hack into it by getting the exact halfway spot. And so that's, that is the full extent um, outside of that. I just made things up in order to make the story as exciting as possible. So um, hopefully it works. I, I, I feel like you put me in the book, Scott, because I was literally on Fort Meade this morning. That's amazing. <laughs> and, and, and I drive by the George W. Bush uh, CIA Center every day on the George Washington Parkway to go to work. So that is so cool. That is awesome. I, I, felt, I felt like I made the drive for you. No, that is that is awesome. So I actually <laughs> did. Um, I actually did like Google map it. And, you know, I'm not going to fly to D.C. Although my son's taking the Washington, D.C. trip in a couple of weeks. I was very tempted to go with him as a chef. <laughs> Just so yeah. I could be like, like, say, this is your home, man. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and, and, and to be fair, the spy museum out here, the International Spy Museum, is a pretty cool place. Have you been here before, Scott? Have you been? No, my, um, so I actually haven't. I really want to go. My buddy was just there, and he was in the bookshop 
And he texted me and he was like, oh my God, you got to call them and get your book in here because they've got a bunch of fiction books, Stuart Gibbs, all the big, all the, all the big writers. So, um, you know, now that the book do, is doing pretty well on Amazon. So like I could contact them and uh, hopefully get in that museum. It'd be really cool. That's awesome. Yeah. So um, the, well, I, need to ask, I need to ask you some more questions too, Drew, about that stuff. Absolutely. Please do. Yeah, that, that sequel, Drew can help you with, with other places and whatever else. I, yeah, I know absolutely. some. I know some people that work for those three letter agencies too. If you need some like fact checking, <laughs> that's awesome. That is so cool, man. No, I love yeah. it. Yeah, and I, I look. I did write some scenes in there, and I, I mean, I'm sure if they read it, they laugh at me, but I don't care. For me, yeah, it's suspended disbelief. It's fiction, so it's all good. Love it. So yeah. 2018, you start the book gets launched earlier this this year in 2024. That's six years. Yeah, that's a long process. A lot of people, probably a lot of rewrites, a lot of edits. What was that like the first time you turned it in and your editor came back? And I don't know. I know whenever I write something and my wife is a teacher, she red checks the hell out of that son of a bitch. So <laughs> what, what what is that like to, you know, you've worked really hard on this, right? It's your baby. And then somebody comes back and says, you need to redo all of this or this or that. Right. So um, I guess to answer that, just to give you some perspective, like, you don't even get an actual book editor unless you get uh, like a book deal. Right. And so I wasn't anywhere near the point where I could even get an actual editor to look at it. So uh, my process was um, I finished it in 2019, the, my first draft. And I was so excited because I, I had spent like, you know, all that time. I probably even started this back in 2017, to be honest. Uh, but I had spent so much time and I, I really was felt like I kind of put the puzzle together with all the twists and turns. And I was really proud of it. And the, one of the reasons and one of the great lessons in this whole process has been um, showing people that asking for help is the only way you're going to do amazing things in life. So um, I went to, I was taking my son, Sammy, at the time to story time at the Urbandale Public Library. I was there all the time. And I would write, write the book there while he played. And uh, when I was finally done, I went up to the librarians that I would, had been around. I barely knew them. And I said, hey, I just finished this book. I'm really proud of it. I'm trying to get it published. And I need somebody that doesn't have the last name Reister to read it and tell me what they think about it and try to help me make it better. And I didn't know if they'd laugh in my face or whatever. And uh, this one woman who I first approached, her name is Julie Finch, who's now a lifelong friend. She was like, yeah, I'd read that. That sounds so cool. And then let me see if there's anybody else. That and then this other woman named Kayla Becker also wanted to read it and help me. And I really didn't know them at all. So over the course of the next like six months um, to maybe even a year, we would meet every month or so. They would read a couple chapters and then we would meet in the little coffee shop area of the library. They would give me some edits and say like, uh, did you realize how sexist this part is? And I was like, no, <laughs> well, things like that. Like I didn't even consider it. Right. And, Cause I'm a guy. And so it was like right. so valuable. And there'd be things like just obvious things I didn't even think about. And so that was huge. And so um, that we did that for like eight months. And then, um, we fi finally felt like, okay, this is as good as it's going to be. I rewrote it a bunch, uh, a bunch of times. I, I, I really kept like the main flow of the story, but fixed a lot of crucial stuff. And then I sent it out to agents and, um, uh, started that in 2019 towards the end of the year. And these, do you guys ever, have you ever heard of the job literary agents? Cause I had never heard of that job. No, no. Okay. So here's how the publishing industry works for people that are interested. You uh, in order to get a book deal, there's two giant hoops you got to get through. Assuming you have an awesome manuscript first, you've got to get a literary agent. And then once you get a literary agent, then you have to do it all over again and hope your literary agent gets you the book deal. So the first hoop to get through is to get a literary agent to want to read your book. And you have to send query letters to literary agents. And there's probably only about 250 to 350 of these literary agents in a database nationwide. So they tell you, don't send it out to like every single one at once. Cause then if you don't hear back, you're done. So um, these agents get um, sometimes 20 to letters a day, you know, thousands of letters a year. They might only sign two authors, if that, per year. So everyone's like, you know, don't be discouraged. It might not happen. And so I, I went into it just hoping, like, it's confident, but I knew the odds were against me. And I got, uh, I started getting responses. And in the first, like, four or five months, I had six agents that wanted to read it. And I was like, yes. And so it was wow. very, um, yeah, it was very like much an affirmation of like knowing I had a really exciting story. Um, and so I finally signed with an agent, um, a woman in Boston named Jessica Reno. She works for a literary agency named Metamorphosis Literary Agency. Um, and I got all the paperwork ironed out right before COVID hit in 2020 because everything takes so slow in publishing. Um, and then when COVID happened, 
um, obviously deals kind of slowed down and there was a couple close calls, uh, nothing. And then, um, in 2022, finally, um, we got a three book deal with young dragons press. It's a publisher in Arkansas. And, um, yeah. And then, so once you get the deal, it was like super exciting. And then that's the part where then they give you the editor, right. And then they give you like, okay, here's our editor. They're going to work with you. Um, the developmental editor reads the whole thing and just tells you, um, this part should be here. This part, there's not enough of this, not enough of that. And then there's the line editor who goes through, um, once you're done with the developmental edits and they're the ones that do the commas and the, you know, grammar and all that stuff. Um, the developmental editor, um, I was thinking he would like want to change a bunch of stuff and give me all these ideas, but really he just gave me some, some like suggestions on how to like liven up the descriptions. But in terms of like the flow of the story, he was like, Scott, like every page, you know, every chapter had a page turn, turner, uh, you know, cliffhanger at the end. And so he, they were really, really thrilled with the manuscript, which was great. Um, so then it just came time to like, you know, work things, things like the cover and the back and the blurb on the back from Casey Blake, you know, little touches like that. Um, so that whole process, that's kind of how that went down. And then, um, from the time I got the book deal to now, it was still two more years because the things move so slow. And then finally, finally, after six years, I finally get this box of books delivered to my house, you know, like mid, uh, mid April of this year. And like, uh, and I didn't want to open it until my whole family was around me. Um, the following morning we were getting ready for school. We woke up early and we all open it together and like it my and my like my wife videoed it and like everyone it was just such a joyous occasion to like just not quitting and just plugging away and then like to actually hold this book this like idea i had in my head and just holding it um after all that all that time um and, not, and really still not knowing if it would happen so it was just so cool man just to see it come out and, and have it and there's my guy it's my baby you know, you know what i've 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 seen you do a couple of interviews and and this is going to sound strange. I, I absolutely love the enthusiasm that you have. Like you can really see the love that you have for the character and for the book and so on and how proud of you are. That's really cool. You don't see that a lot, how passionate people are about that. Yeah. I'm a, I'm an enthusiastic guy by nature, but um, I guess since it's just been part of me for so long and like such a dream and like, I don't know, I, I knew the odds were against me and I kept on telling myself. And I also like to listen to a lot of motivational podcast um and one thing that i heard uh, that, that really helped me and they can help a lot of people was whatever your dream is you are the only one that gets to decide when the dream dies right because if somebody tells you like rejects you or doesn't you know you don't get the call back or the email back um it's up to you whether to say oh well that didn't work out or you just keep going and keep on pursuing other avenues and i just said right. to myself as long as i keep trying like I'm, I, this is going to happen. Right. I just knew it was going to happen. So I just kept trying and, um, and it happened. And so I was, I'm just so excited for everyone to read this book and it's been such a great lesson to, um, and so many different fronts. I'm just, that that's, I guess that's where my enthusiasm comes from. It was fascinating to me, Scott, that you went through this process during COVID as well. You, you would think like book writing, like that kind of stuff would like, that stuff would boom during COVID because that's kind of like a non-contact kind of situation, right? You, you would think like that, that kind of um, work would like continue on. Um, so I, I found, I found it fascinating first off how long it takes, obviously like just, just writing the book, you know, taking several years to, to complete. Uh, I found it fascinating that you had to go through COVID with that and that, you know, things like books, uh, also suffered like through the COVID pandemic as well, because you would think like that work path would, would continue on. Yeah. And I don't know the ins and outs of it. I could just know from what my agent was saying, it was, it was slow going on, on her end from landing a lot of deals. I know there were book deals being made, but certainly it was, it was just a time in the industry. It looks like a lot of industries, they were kind of waiting to see what would happen. A lot of things like that. Um, I know a lot of people were also writing books during that time. So it probably got even more competitive. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was just a lot of waiting and, and there was a lot of doubt, even though I had the agent and she was shopping it, there were times where it was like, I don't know if it would ever happen. So, um, but yeah, definitely an interesting time. And, um, I actually wrote another book during that time, um, that <laughs> I wrote <laughs> a, a quick side note. I got to tell you a quick, funny story. So my son, um, he was like, I was picking him up from preschool and he says, dad, who was alive during the olden days? 
the presidents and dinosaurs. <laughs> and I was like, what? And it, like, it, like he was thinking like in my mind, I'm thinking of like a little house in the prairie episode where there's like a collection of like Lincoln and Washington and T-Rex. And, <laughs> and it was like the funniest comment a preschooler would make. And I thought to myself, that's going to be the most amazing book in the world. And so like all during COVID, I read this thick John Adams book and then I studied dinosaurs and I wrote some time travel book about presidents versus dinosaurs where they all like you know, the presidents all get sucked in the same time spot and the dinosaurs battle each other. So I actually wrote that book and my agent read it and she wanted me to fix a bunch of stuff. This was, it was like a whole serious thing. And so once I get through this series, it's three books, I'm going to go back to presidents versus dinosaurs. And uh, that would be a cool thing. If that, that was a book in five years. Uh, I'm going to take a quick break, Scott. We got about 10 minutes left with you. I, I want to come back. I want to ask you, a little bit about what's next for for Zane, and then uh, a, a fun question about who's going to play those characters when they make it a movie. So <laughs> let's uh, let's get a word from our uh, partners down at Revelton Distilling Company. Big shout out for Rob and Christy down at Dis down at Revelton. Their bourbon releases on on Saturday. It's been two years and one day. Uh, as as uh, he always answered the question when we would ask him when his bourbon's going to be ready. It's ready when it's ready. Well, guess what, guys? It's ready. So uh, let's get a word from Revelton. We'll come back with Scott. Why take the best corn in the world and make it into fuel when you could make it into whiskey? That's the question that launched Revelton, Iowa's most visible and fastest growing distillery. Owners Rob and Christy Taylor embrace the grain to glass philosophy, sourcing ingredients locally and overseeing on-premises production and bottling at their facility in Osceola. One sip, and you'll agree that Revelton's handcrafted whiskeys, gins, and vodkas are the best you've ever tasted. And with the launch of their rye whiskey, made with 100% Iowa-grown rye and corn, and their new bourbon coming soon, there's more Revelton to love than ever. Iowa's own Revelton Distillery. ReveltonDistillery.com all right. And thanks again, obviously, uh, Rob and Christy. Can't wait to see you guys on Saturday. I'll be down there about 10 a.m. Uh, I'm going to actually text Rob and see if I can get in early since he's my best friend and I don't have to wait in line. So, <laughs> yeah. Hey, if you can send a bottle this way, Chris, over to the East Coast, that would be great. Uh, yeah. Your, no, your, your, cho your choice. You I'll know? get right on that. Absolutely. I already got told by three other people I have to send bottles. I'm going to go to uh, jail by sending this alcohol through the mail. So yeah, we, yeah, we're not talking about that. We're not anyway. talking about that, Scott. Uh, so the book's published. What? Uh, when is the recording for the audio version? Because uh, I'm sure that that would get a lot of play. I know. Uh, jokingly, I heard. Uh, I heard uh, Travis Justice say you could go to his uh, to a studio and record it, uh, but not now because apparently it's flooded. But that's a whole other story. <laughs> Yikes! I didn't know that. Travis has yeah. to get those pipes fixed. I guess. Yeah, he's uh, got to get those pipes fixed, but. Um, uh, is there is it in the works to to do to do that next? I mean, if it's the fastest selling book on Amazon, that's that's got to give you a leg up there, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's great advertising. So Amazon goes by category, so it's not like the number one new release overall. It's the top new release in its baseball category. So that's still pretty awesome. That's that's super awesome that I can use that to advertise and plug it. And so our agents, uh, my agent Jessica Reno. Um, I'm, I'm actually tonight going to be sending her a bunch of pictures from all the, the book launch we did yesterday and all the events we've had so far. And she takes that and kind of builds up the buzz and, you know, gives the sales numbers and she pitches that to different companies that read audiobooks. And then same thing. Yeah. If, if uh, she'll be, she'll be working all our angles and trying to get media rights sold and, and that kind of thing, that would be amazing. It would be a dream come true. And as you guys read this book, all the fun of like little league being life or death. Um, yeah, you guys, uh, you can totally envision it as being some kind of, you know, Netflix series or prime series or movie or something like that. That would be incredible. I would love it. So that leads into the question who the, the, the main character obviously is Zane. Obviously the federal agent has got a big part. Who's playing Zane and who's playing the federal agent. Um, can I, I, if I hold a picture up, I don't know if it'll look good or not. So you probably yep. can't see this at all. So this was, hold on a second. I'm going to angle this light. So this is pretty funny. This is yesterday at Barnes and Noble. This okay. is me dressed up like Zane Mitchell. And then those are two agents. There's Agent Finch and Agent Becker who are in the book. Those are the two, those are the two librarians that helped me edit the book. <laughs> and I, I awesome. them as, characters. as a thank you, I put them in the book. Uh, like two of the agents are named Agent Finch and Agent Becker. And then at the book yesterday at Barnes & Noble, 
they show up totally dressed up like agents. <laughs> uh, my friend Julie, yeah, uh, she looked like uh, like Neo from the Matrix, and it was hilarious. And yeah, and Zane's Zane's not a forty four year old man in the book, but I don't care. <laughs> I just have to Zane, so I can't play Zane. Wouldn't work. I I don't know who's the who's the who's a good 14 year old actor. Give it to that kid. I don't know. <laughs> I, I couldn't even name one, but yeah, me neither. Um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't know. That, that to... would be a great problem to have. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Where, so where's your next events at and where can people uh, meet you, get the book signed, obviously pick it up here in town. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Jordan Creek Barnes and Noble is if you want to go get it right away, the Barnes and Noble at university Avenue, uh, all uh, is that is that Clive or I don't even know where That's that Clive. is. That That's yeah, Clive. Okay. Clive. Yeah. So the Clive location at Three Fountains, uh, they're supposed to be get, getting it in by the end of next week. I know it's in Ames and Dog Your Books. It's in Indianola, also at Page Turner's Bookstore. And hold on, I'm pulling up my events right here. If you go to my Facebook page, Scott Reister Author page, I have a whole list of this stuff. Um, I'm going to be doing libraries almost. I have like seven or eight libraries lined up for this summer. It's super fun. So different communities around Iowa. I'm going to be getting out there a lot. I did Urbandale Little League set up shop there. Um, my most immediate one coming up Tuesday, May 21st, Beaverdale Books at 630. And then Saturday, June 8th at the other Barnes and Noble there on University Ave. And then from there, it's just me driving around town. Um, I'm going to be doing something with Des Moines Parks and Rec also. I think they're buying books for all their kids in their summer program, which is awesome. Um, I'm trying to work all my connections I can to try to get the book spread far and wide. So, um, you know, right now the book's got some good momentum. I don't want it to peter out. It's up to me now to, you know, see how high I can push it. So, yeah, anybody that sees this can share a picture that they see for me. Uh, get the book, leave a review. That's always really big. So um, it's a great book. You guys will love it. And if you guys have, uh, even if you don't like baseball, you know, people of all ages seem to really eat it up. Awesome. And, and, and I think you have a great idea, Scott, with like trying to get it into the, the spy museum out here. I mean, the book is based in this area. I, I mean, it sells itself there with just locality, right? So, you know, I anybody, mean, you, you got any connections in the museum? At the museum itself, I don't. Uh, you do know a guy that does. I know a guy that does. Like five degrees of Kevin Bacon or whatever. Yes, yes. Hey, that that works. Yeah, I can nice. I I could work something. Scott. I think so. I think I could. Dude, I would. Yeah, seriously. If you know a guy that like he, he actually has someone's number that would know uh, a way to get it in, um, and I could say. You know, you know, a friend of mine's got this book. People in DC would love it. It's you know doing doing great. Yeah, any connection. Um, yeah, I'm just uh, I'm just. It's now it's up to me in the networking game. So um, it's been fun. Yeah, I'd be very grateful, Drew. Yeah, I technically work for recruiting and retention, Scott. So me just getting on the metro and going to the spy museum itself and just be like, hey, I know a guy. Literally wrote a book about baseball and spy. Like, how does this work? I'll, 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 we'll work it, Scott. Set we'll in Washington, it. D.C. That seems set, like a no-brainer. Yeah, set in Washington, D.C. <laughs> no problem. Well, um, you guys, I'm going to mail you guys each a book. I'm going to sign it for you. You guys can show it around to everybody. So I'll be mailing you guys a book. Um, oh, man, I appreciate that. You. That's awesome. Yeah, you guys, yeah, you'll love it. And yeah, you guys uh, spread the news. And uh, yeah, it's, it's it's podcasts like this and, and all the connections yeah, I'm making now. And also for my past, like I have people I haven't talked to in 30 years, like my former Little League teammates are like <laughs> – Seriously, it's been mind blowing. They're like, "How come I wasn't in that book?" Oh yeah, I know. Yeah, exactly. Like my kids are characters, but my wife doesn't really have a character, so that's I kind of had to pay for that. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> that's why there's another book coming. I'll make it up to her. So, uh, yeah. if you made it up that's to awesome. her today, Scott, it's oh, I did. Go. That's right. I was good. I was. I did a lot of good stuff today. I'm good. There you, there go. you go. You're good for a year then. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Scott, really appreciate you taking time to 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 come on with us. Uh, would love to. Uh, to hook back up with you when you're even more famous. Uh, and, <laughs> but, uh, uh, we will absolutely promote it as best we can. And, and you share this podcast and we'll, we'll do what we can. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you guys. It was yep. great hanging out with you tonight. I really appreciate it being on. No Thanks, problem. Scott. Thanks Scott. Appreciate it, man. Thanks. That was awesome. All right. Thank you so much from Scott. Uh, what we're going to do is, uh, Drew, why don't we take another break? Uh, let's take a break from, uh, from Kyle. Uh, layman at Wintrust Mortgage. We'll get uh, a word from him. Uh, I know that him and his buddies are working on a little podcast idea for the Three Beards Media Network. Uh, but uh, when we come back, then let's catch up with what you've been up to and, and what's going on. All right. So Sounds good, man. Are you in the market for a new house and unsure of the mortgage process? Want to know that you have someone looking out for you? 
Kyle Lehman from Wintrust Mortgage is a down-to-earth, knowledgeable lender who can be there for you in your corner. He can work with you in any of the 50 states and is just what you need to expand your home search. Kyle will work with you through the entire process with little to no work from you. Take the worry of the mortgage process out of the equation so that you can focus on looking for your dream home. Contact Kyle at www.wintrust.com forward slash Kyle dash Lehman or call him at 515-473-0546. All right. Uh, be sure to hit up Kyle uh, for any of those mortgage needs. So, Drew, uh, man, that was super cool. I, I love how passionate he is, right? That Wouldn't it be a, nice yeah, to have something incredible. that passionate about? <laughs> Yeah, it would. It, it really would, Chris. It, it gives you purpose, right? Uh, I mean, the man's put so much time into that that project, right? Six that, years. Six years, and that's just one. Yeah, he's got to set. He's got to set for three. So imagine, like, putting your whole, like, a whole generation of time into this three book series. Basically, if you just look at it that way, just call it six years times three, right? Yep. Right. Give or take. Um, that, that's incredible dedication. Yeah, yeah, the passion he had on his face just talking about it uh, is awesome, and and it connects with me too, right? Because I'm I'm, I'm local, like DC, yep. right over there. Um, I love baseball. Obviously, came from an Orioles game today. Um, it, it connects. I can't wait. I'm, I'm so grateful that he's sending us a copy. That, that's I know. I'm sweet. I'm super excited. I I I used to read so much before. I I. I haven't read as much. I don't know why. I think just because life is get gets busy or whatever else. But I'm and I'm kind of old school. I, there's been a couple of times I've went on Amazon. I'm like, oh, I could download it to the to the app and read it. But I like having that hard book in my hand, bending the pages, marking the pages, things like that. I just I'm I'm really into doing that. I I am uh, I'm embarrassed to admit this, Chris, but uh, uh, New Year's resolution 2023. I had a resolution that I was going to read three books in that year, in 2023. How many do you think I read in 2023? Uh, zero. I didn't read one fucking page. Chris. <laughs> not, one, not one fucking page. And I got a book that I want to read. I, I got uh, Kirk Herbstreet's book. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Have you have you read that yet? I haven't, but I, it would be a good book. I'm got, much more. I'm much more into like like biographies and things like that. So something like yeah. that would be interesting to me, but kind of in your wheelhouse, I am a huge war world two first account book stuff. Like I will read anything I can get my hands on of somebody's not necessarily a famous person, but somebody's first hand account of their experience or whatever else. Yeah. Like the, like band of brothers type stuff. Yeah. 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 I, I've probably read unbroken. Probably six times. Hey, do oh, do wow. you know what that book is? Uh, I'm not 100 percent familiar. So, no. Unbroken is written about uh, a, a man named Louis Zamperini. He ran in the 32 Olympics. Uh, I'm sorry, he ran in the 36 Olympics uh, for track and field. He became a Navy uh, a bomber uh, in the Pacific. He was shot down over the Pacific. Survived. 63 days at sea was picked up uh, by the Japanese and spent several years in a POW camp where he was tortured every single day of his life. Now, and he survived, but the oh most amazing part about this book is, is his redemption after he gets rescued and he goes home, he meets a wife, he, he meets his wife and he's obsessed with wanting to, exact revenge on this colonel that beat him every single day of his life um, to the point where he was drunk. He was a drunk all the time. And he, and I'm not like, I'm not into like, you know, crazy right ring religious stuff, but he went to a Billy Graham uh, revival, his wife drugging. And he said, if he may, if he says that we're going to pray in there, I'm fucking leaving because I prayed every day in that POW camp and nobody listened to me. And so of course, you know, Billy Graham starts to pray and he leaves. His wife drags him back the next night and his life changes instantly that night. 
and immediately begins to forgive everybody that, that tortured him or whatever. To the point where he never had a drink after that. He uh, was obsessed then with meeting uh, that colonel so he could personally forgive him and f- to him. And in the 80, I think it was like the 88 Winter Olympics in Japan, he ran the torch in Japan less than three miles from the camp that he stayed in. Holy shit. It is an amazing book. It's also a movie. The movie cuts off when they rescue him. But to me, the more inspiring part of that story is his, the forgiveness that he gives this this guy. But the book is so interesting. It's so good. So 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 my question, Chris, is did he actually get to uh, meet with this colonel? That colonel would not refuse to meet him. Refuse. Really? And wow. he was prosecuted for war crimes for the longest time. But he was alive in Japan when he ran the torch uh for the olympics after that and he offered to meet him and forgive him and and that colonel would not meet him i have a problem with the whole concept chris since we're on this like war path per se of war crimes and what they are yeah right because it's 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 your life or mine at the end of the day right like being in it been in it twice what like the people that we are fighting have no ethical, moral compass on, on killing a person like, you know, disabling, whatever, whatever you want to call it, Chris, what it, right. It's, yep. Uh, uh, pro- it could be propaganda on either way. It's, it's murder to them of what we yep. do to them and vice versa. They murdered six Marines, whatever. Sure. Yep. Uh, but I call a spade a spade. I call war war. I don't understand why necessarily, there are war crimes like you, you, you win or you lose. Right. That That's how I, that's how I see war. <laughs> you either, you either go home, you either go home or you don't. I get, I get that. I, and I, uh, I'll preface this by saying I, I have no idea what that's like. And, sure. and you know how I feel about you personally. I, I admire you. I admire what you do for this country and what for us. And I would never, ever at any point, say anything that would be offensive to you. Sure. But is there a point where and I there's no rules, right? I know there's no rules. But is there a point where you if there's an a surrender or 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 to some point where you then at that point have moved past that he's your enemy and now it's another human being and you don't necessarily have to to, to give them everything, but you also don't have to, to, to continue to, uh, for his example, the example obviously is, is, is Louis Zamperini, right? He was captured. Yep. He's in a, he's in a prisoner of war camp at that point. Yeah. He should be in their mind. They should, he should be imprisoned. He's fighting our country or whatever, but doesn't that cross the line to beat him every single day? Like, isn't that, now you're yeah. crossing into just being just cruel instead of giving, you know, a, treating them like it, like a human being. 100%. It's a war crime, Chris, I mean, back right. to back to that key word of war crime, but who's holding these people accountable, right? Uh, Absolutely. Right. Yes. So, 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 so what would I show mercy to somebody that we have captured? We know they're done. Like they're, they're no longer combative. Yes, because legally that is what we have to do, right? And, and, and now we will we will give them three hot meals a day, and they will yep. be they will be enslaved or, or captured until a, a point of somebody higher than me saying this person's going here, or they're getting released, right. or we just keep them captive, right? So, yeah. But but on the other end of it, and modern day warfare is they're they're treating people like us that get captured exactly how you just you know right yeah how the story is and then cutting their heads off on live tv right right so i have a problem with that so it, it's it's hard to it, it's hard to get a full picture of what's right and wrong yep. when you know what 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 if i found that dude that cut off my buddy's head 
you know, my battle. That would be said. that would be impossible to 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 know what to do. Right, and I'm not saying I've ever been in that situation, Chris. I'm just saying no. I understand that, that. In, in general. Right, I, uh, I could. It would be very hard if you're with your buddies and somebody is somebody maims you, your buddy right next to you, and then five minutes later you capture him, and he surrenders. That's very hard to not want to exact. I revenge, I couldn't even tell I mean? you what I, I couldn't even tell you what I would no. do. No. Right. And that's that's why that's why the, the people that go into what you go into deserve so much respect and so much. I, I don't. I, I there's no possible way I could know what that's like. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and and that's why that's why people the the the, the phrase you never know what somebody's going through or whatever. I I would not sit here and judge that. That would not be my my case to judge. Um, and you're right. It, is it a war crime? What on the other side, they might consider what you do to them a war crime and you're giving them three meals a day and treating them with respect, but you're making them work X, X, Y, Z or whatever. So it's, I mean, I guess that goes to whoever wins the war gets, gets to make the rules, I guess. You know that's what I exactly, mean? That's exactly it. But there yeah. you go. You hammered yeah. the point home right there. Yeah. You win, you win or you lose, you come right. home or you don't. And, but and I, I would, you know, I have the utmost respect. That particular book just spoke to me on so many levels. Not necessarily just because he, obviously, what a strong-willed person he was that he that he lived through that. But then to 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 forgive that kind of stuff is very powerful. Oh yeah, it's very powerful. Well, and the fact that he made it clear to the eighty-eight Olympics, and this happened yeah. in the you know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. He. Yeah. He was quite old yeah so yeah. and you know people like john mccain is another one to me i, I i've said this a hundred times and you know this podcast we can get into any kind of we get into any discussions here so uh I, i'm a clear person that probably wouldn't vote republican again because the republican party is not what it used to be but in 2008 i caucus for john mccain uh, I'm sorry, in 2000, I caucused for John McCain. That anybody to me that is was in the statue that he was and that his father was the head of the of the Atlantic or the Pacific Fleet and they knew who he was and they gave him a chance to go home and he refused to go home until the rest of his buddies went home. That you That's not somebody that makes that shit up. That's in your core as who you are as a human being. 100%. And, and I could vote for somebody like that. And, and to be honest, in, in the year 2000, Chris, he he was clearly the most qualified candidate. Like, yes. it's not like Absolutely. it's not even it's not even a matter of opinion. Right. Right. So a, war, a, a wartime fighter, you know, uh, like, yep, he was a maverick. Been, he'd been there, done that. Yeah, he, he, he was progressive ahead of his time for, for a, a party that was, you know, yep. let, let's be honest. Let's be honest, Chris. Both parties are stale as shit. A hundred percent. I listen. They're, I, bo they're, they're both when our crackers, so choices are an eighty-one year old and a seventy-seven year old. We are so screwed up right now in this country. It's not even funny. So I'm a hundred percent in agreement with that. So I, uh, I, I've made myself clear why I'm not going to vote for for Donald Trump. The number one reason is what he said about John McCain. So yeah, that's that's, that's, that's number shitty. one for me. So it's pretty. It's pretty shitty for sure. Yeah. Um, so, and that I, I, I tend to vote for people and people call me cynical and put people call me and, you know, I, you can sometimes see what a person really is, right. And their character or whatever else, how they've done, how they've lived their life, how they, you know what I mean? I, yeah. John McCain, I, I, I caucus for, I would have voted for if he wanted, would have won the nomination uh, hands down because I know that deep down he was a good man. He oh, may, yeah. he, him and I may not agree on certain issues, but I knew at the end of the day, he always had the American people's best interest at heart. 100%. Uh, I, I feel the same way uh, uh, about Biden. I, I think he's a good man. I wish that he wasn't the candidate. I wish he wasn't the candidate four years ago. 
but it is what it is. So yeah, that's what rubbed me the wrong way, Chris, because because I, I may surprise you in, in saying this, but I I was a caucus captain for Pete Buttigieg. I was for the, too. For, for, I for was the too. very se- for the very same reason. He's 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 served our country. Yep. Um, a, a young, thoughtful, progressive, new ideas, fresh blood type yep. deal. And then my my caucus, Joe Biden wasn't even viable in. Um, and and I think it was that way across most of the Des Moines metro. I I, I think he maybe maybe got fifth place. Yeah, maybe. In in Iowa, and I I have a hard time. You know, with with the DNC still pushing Joe Biden down the throat of the of the convention, I agree. I to agree. that 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 left me stale with yep. with the party. Like, I I, 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 don't I even actually know what the other words. I don't even know what the words are for it, Chris. I actually um, I actually felt that way in 2016 with Hillary Clinton. I thought the DNC did a disservice to Bernie Sanders to to anybody in the Democratic Party. She yeah. was the card carrying person, and they were gonna. There was no, there was no ifs, ands, or buts. The Democratic Party wanted Hillary Clinton, Clinton to be the nominee, and nobody else got a chance. That's that's the truth. And as qualified as she might have been, the writing was on the wall with her. Yeah, you you anybody that wants to blame Donald Trump being president, you can go back and blame Hillary Clinton because. She had so much baggage on her and so much crap put on her. She was never going to win that. Never. And I don't, I know she had the most popular votes. I get it. Guess what? That's not how you win the presidential election. That's right. So uh, that's not how that works. You nominated somebody that people thought were so despicable that they looked at that dude and said, yeah, he's a viable option. So what does that tell you? Yeah. Jason Price wants to know which one the real Shipley is. (laughs) <laughs> i'd say we're equal uh yeah yeah let's go with that let's go with that yeah. it's so. too it's too it's too late to figure that one out i think that's right no shit <laughs> no shit oh man but uh but yeah so i you know we, we somehow moved into this conversation but for me it's 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 character and whatever else and that goes back to what to, to that book that I read about Louis Samperini. So, um, yeah. but books like that, first account books like that are, I'm obsessed with reading that stuff. That makes sense. Yeah. I so, prefer, I, I prefer true stories as well. Yeah. I do too. Yeah. I, there's not a lot of fiction books that I'll read. I don't, I mean, I'm going to read Scott. I'm, I'm going to read Scott. I am too. Absolutely. <laughs> I am too. That's going to be awesome. Uh, and, and I've read, I did read all the Harry Potter books. Um, just because, and God, I'm going to get crucified for this. I did read the, uh, I, I did read the the vampire books, whatever those were. The Twilight Twilight books. I I thought I thought you were going to say Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> <laughs> no, I watched those movies. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's that, that's more of a vi- that's more of a visual, uh... <laughs> right? I know, right? Well, listen, uh. We're, we're going to run uh, Steph Copley's STFU moment uh, uh, so that we can invite people to uh, to donate to the Young Women's Resource Center. And guess what, Drew? You've never got to do the STFU segment. Oh, so man. here you go. Now's your chance. I'll shut the fuck up and you get to say whatever you want after this ad. So uh, let's All get right. a word from Steph Copley. Hey, everybody. It's Steph Copley, the woman behind the STFU segment on the Old Man Strength podcast. When I told the guys I wanted to sponsor this segment, they recommended that I make a charitable donation instead. So that's what I did. I chose the Young Women's Resource Center in Des Moines, Iowa. They're a nonprofit that supports, educates, and advocates for girls and young women ages 10 to 24. Their whole goal is to make sure that these young women become strong, self-confident, and successful. And if you know me at all, you know that aligns with my goals as well. If you're interested and would like to donate, check them out at ywrc.com org and donate today and remember don't forget to stfu and listen every once in a while thanks such a good organization and steph is one of the best so all right drew we're going to close out the show i'm going to shut the fuck up you gonna say whatever you want <laughs> uh I'm, I'm going to take the low-hanging fruit chris you know we were kind of talking we were leaning into politics there a little bit um 
and the general message I would really just like to say is, is be kind, be kind to people. You don't know what people are going through. There's no reason to call people, uh, you know, bigots and racists if they vote this way. There's no reason to call them baby killers or communists if they vote this way. There's, there's no reason for that. That's not productive, Chris. Uh, just the general message of being kind to people. Like there's no, you're not going to get anything done. Otherwise there's, there, there's no partisan bipartisanship in, in this country anymore. There's like very few things in this country that bring people together. Um, I'd like, I'd like to see more of that. Um, and I don't know what that looks like anymore. Chris, like baseball after nine 11 for me. Yeah. You know, G- George W. Bush going out to Yankee stadium, throwing out that first pitch, by the way, an absolute fucking dime that he yeah. threw, you know, yep. 70 mile an hour, right down the freaking pipe, like courage that man had to go out there in that moment, you know, <laughs> it, it, that city, the city and, and ruins and whatnot. Um, I haven't seen the country galvanized like that since. I haven't either. And, and, and I'm not sure what it's going to take to get there, but, yeah. I, but I, we're going to eventually have to have faith in the American people to get it done. So uh, all that again, to say, be kind, like and, 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 and what Steph said, uh, shut the fuck up and listen. That's right. Like, have uh, listen to what people have to say. People have good ideas that you don't necessarily agree with or vote with, Yeah. But, but they're still good ideas. You can't just say, fuck you. I, right. I don't like who you're voting for shutting you down. Like that doesn't make any sense. It's not conducive to anything. Um, so anyway, be, 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 be kind Chris. That's it. I, like, that's I think, where I'm at. I think you're spot on. And I think when you strip away somebody's politics, uh, I'll give you a good example. You you mentioned George Bush. You look at George Bush and Michelle Obama's interactions uh, and how much fun they seem to have with each other. You look, cool. at, you look at Bill Clinton and and how he speaks glowingly of George's of George Sr. And how much they when they bonded over working through Katrina and things like that. Um, and, you know, even on smaller scales here, I'll, I'll give you a good example. Uh, and I've, I've mentioned this before on the pod before. Teddy, Holly, and I, when we first started interacting on Twitter, we blocked each other. <laughs> uh, we got into it about, I can't even remember what it was. It was it was dumb. It was stupid. I would do anything in the world for Teddy, Holly right now. He's been so kind to us and so kind to me and been a great friend of mine. Um I would do anything in the world for Teddy and I don't give his two shits who he votes for. I, and I don't, and I don't care. And I don't know. You know what I mean? Uh, Rob Taylor, who runs Revelton distilling company was a Republican legislature in the Iowa house. I, I I'd do anything in the world for Rob. Those types of things don't matter in the real world. It's the fringes that get all the attention. Yep. The people here in the middle, they don't. So, and that's kind of what we try to do here on, in, in, and I, I think in all these, th- these podcasts that we do for three bridge media is bring people together and try to do some good. At least that's what I want to do. So, and you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, our newest partner, Andrew Downs, um, Andrew uh, for AKC marketing. Uh, I had an event at my work uh, last week. Uh, it was a big, huge awards dinner. We started a month ago. And I had so much stuff that I sent Andrew to get, and he knocked it out of the park for us. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, he did such a great job. So uh, um, not only am I proud that he's a sponsor here, but I'm proud to, to do business with him uh, through my regular job as well. So, No, that's great. And and, and shout out to Teddy, right? So, uh, I mean, he, he opened his new cantina, right? He, he, rebranded, yeah. uh, he rebranded Beer Can Alley to like yep. a, a a cantina style restaurant is i believe yeah they right? just i think they soft opened and they just opened last week down there uh across the street from high v right on court avenue uh where the old beer can alley used to be yeah super excited to go out there so what bet. did jason price just say i missed that i, I don't agree with drew 98 percent of the time but i still love him <laughs> <laughs> is this now let me put this together is this the price board operator a price family board up. He, he, yes. He's, okay. He, he is. The, he is the younger brother of the price family board up. Oh, yes. Okay, I got you. 
yeah, yeah. yeah. He's right. he's in my class. He's my best friend. So, yep. My best well, man in my wedding, as a matter of fact. Look at that. Yeah, that, coming up November. I'll be I'll I'll be home in November. Oh, I thought sure. you meant maybe your first wedding. I was going to ask you how that went. <laughs> <laughs> About this as well number, as my first one. This, this, is, this is number three now, Chris. So we're uh, we're out. Third this time's a charm, baby. This, this Third time's it. a charm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yep. All right. We got to get out of here. Fuck, it's like 11 o'clock for you. You got to go to bed. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Drew, I appreciate you hopping on, man. We need to we need to do more to, more together. We need to do some I agree. more. So together. So. All right, uh, let's check out everybody else. We got an episode of Like Father, Like Daughter. So if you're not sick of my face yet, uh, you can watch us. You can watch my kid roast me tomorrow night uh, on our little family podcast. Uh, I missed False Starts last week because I actually had that work event. Uh, so guess what, Bill Blank? I wasn't doing something for We Will Collective like you thought I was. I was doing something for my real job. So hey, uh, hey, uh, hey! I would have tro- I would have trolled you in that way too. I, I know he did. He totally hammered me for it. But that episode with Tony Rock uh, was absolutely hysterical. It's a good one. That's so awesome. uh, with that, uh, Drew, I'll let you close it out. Yeah, I, I mean, I, uh, thanks for having me on, Chris. I, I enjoyed the time. Uh, I, now I'm officially old man strength. So. AARP cards back in the mail, so I'm, I'm I'm expecting magazines and a safety kit or whatever <laughs> whatever you've got. <laughs> whatever you got. I get need. a do I do I get a little whistle or you get a little whistle and everything else. That's right, you bet. <laughs> a little lifeline button, you'll be all right. Oh man! All right, guys, thank you guys so much. Thanks again, Scott Reister. Go check out his book, Baseball Spy, uh, on Amazon and at the bookstore at the Barnes and Noble bookstores, and uh, keep an eye on the social so you can find out where he's going to be at. And with that, we are out of here.